Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller boards offer a wide range of possibilities for remote monitoring and control of our projects. By adding a web server, we can open up a web-based interface to allow us to see what's happening by using our potentiometer here and to control the actual devices on our boards. So let me show you how to add a web server to your project. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller boards offer up a great range of opportunities for remote monitoring and control of our projects. Um, in a previous tutorial, I did show you how to get the basic Wi-Fi connection set up, but in this one, we're gonna build upon that and actually add a web server to our project. And doing this lets us create a web-based interface for both monitoring um, what's happening inside our project, but also to then control it. Um, and we're gonna use this to effectively build up into a web-based API system that will let us do a reasonably complex um, web-based interface, um, which will let us then display what's happening and, and control it. Now, I'm going to be actually splitting this whole project up into three tutorials. So in this one, we're going to actually develop the, the main web server software and show how we can get that up and running so that we can communicate and receive information back from our project. Uh, and then we'll go on to look at how we can um, improve that in the following two tutorials, all the way up to the full web-based interface that you saw in the um, short introduction video. Now, um, I will be using a Raspberry Pi Pico for this um, in MicroPython, uh, but any MicroPython enabled uh, and Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller, such as an ASP32 and so on, will, will, will work pretty much um, exactly as it does here. So let's get started by having a look at what we need to do and get plugged into our Pi Pico and um, start programming. So if we first consider what a web server actually does, so when you use your web browser to visit a website, you tell it which web page address or URL that you want to view. So your web browser then sends an HTTP request to the server that handles that website. Now these requests can be simple GET requests for perhaps a static web page, or they can contain more complex commands as part of an application programming interface or an API. Now these requests might also be in the form of an HTTP post that has a range of data attached to it. So our web server needs to listen for and decode this request. It then needs to take the appropriate action to service that request, either getting access to a file to serve that back or to go and um, prepare some data. And it then needs to package all of this information up into an HTTP response message. And that then gets sent back to the client to let it know if the request was successful. And also it will contain any of the code or data that the client requested. So in essence, we're going to need to build three sections of code. An HTTP request parser to receive and decode the client's request. A request handler to then take any actions required and, re and prepare any data. And then an HTTP, HTTP response builder to package and send back that information to the client. So let's go through each of these sections in turn. So as we said, when, when our browser connects to a website, it sends this formatted block of data, which is called this HTTP request. Now we can easily see what data is being sent um, by getting our MicroPython code to print out the request text after accepting a connection. So if we strip down our Python code from the previous tutorial and just make a basic HTTP request receiver, we can capture this data and then start to analyze its format. Now, to help in this process of debugging all this and creating these requests, I'm going to use a package called Postman. So if you visit their website at postman.com, you can sign up for a free account. account. And then um, just simply in your My Workspace area, you can create collections of HTTP requests, which you can then use for testing. 
So, so here in my account, I've set up some GET requests and some POST requests that I can then send to my Raspberry Pi Pico uh, using the Pico's IP address on my Wi-Fi network. So if I send one of these requests, I can see the request data coming through in my REPL console on the Pi Pico, and then the Pico's response to that will go back out to the Postman application. So let's take a look at a few of these requests uh, to see what format is actually coming across. So this first block of data is, is the raw data which has come from a standard um, GET HTTP request. So as you can see, this is received as a continuous stream of byte data. Now we then need to use MicroPython, MicroPython string.decode method and that will then translate it into a standard Python string rather than this byte string as it currently stands. Now if we, if we, we do the, however look at this byte stream you'll see some certain characters in there. So these slash r slash n characters are the carriage return line feed codes or the CRLF codes um, which basically denote the end of lines. And they, and you, you can see here that this then, if we do do use the string.decode method, it gives us our decoded request, which is now broken up on these um, carriage return line feed characters into the separate lines that make up our GET request. Now it's important to note here, uh, again if we look directly at the raw data, you'll see that we do end up with um, the two carriage return line feed codes at the end of this section. Uh, and that really gives us the end of the lines that says connection keep alive, and then followed by a blank line with no data on it. And that is significant, uh, as we'll see as we come to analyse the rest of our request data. So, so looking at this request then, we can start to break it down and we'd break it down into three sections. So the first line is the actual request itself. And this itself can split down into further three parts separated by spaces. So the first word is our HTTP method or, or our HTTP verb as it's sometimes called. So this particular one then is using the get request method. Now, as we'll see in, in a few seconds, um, there are a few different methods, um, but the most common other one which you'll come across is the POST request. Now, the second word in this line is the full URL of the resource being requested. And again, this can further be broken down into the page URL, which is the page.html part of this, and then the query string, which is all of the data following that question mark. The final word then on this first line of our request is the protocol being used. And here we can see that we're using HTTP version 1.1. So the remaining lines of this particular request form the header section. And as you can see, there is one header per line. And each of those starts with the header name, followed by a colon, followed by the header value. And these basically give us information about the request in various formats and so on. Now, as I mentioned above, um, there is an important blank line at the end of the header section, and this blank line indicates the end of the header and the start of the third section, which is the request body. Now, in this particular GET request, there isn't any actual body data. So, so for comparison, let, let's look at a more complex POST request. So here again, we can see the request line at the very start of this, showing that we are making a POST request to the slash API endpoint. And then it's followed by this header section, then followed by a blank line, and then followed by a number of lines of data that make up the body of the request. So if we look at the header section, you'll see that we have a number of other um, headers in here. And one of these is the content type header. Now this tells us what format the body of our request has been encoded as. So in this instance, it's specifying multi-part slash form data, which means that we are being sent some sort of form data, which in effect is a, num a series of named variables. But again, it's in this idea of a multi-part format. And again, we'll, we'll look at that in more detail when we come to decode this um, request.
For this particular one then, we, we can see there that we have other um, bits of information that tell us how we um, need to process this request. So we've got a boundary definition here, which tells us how these multi parts have been broken up and, and so on. If we then now look at the body, so again, we've got that blank line after our header section, and then we have the body data. You can see that this boundary string that was defined in the headers is now being used and basically to divide up this data into various sections. So each of these sections then has its own header section, which you can see here then specifies the name of the variable and the body section for that particular block that then specifies the value of that variable. And then this is really the format that are our two computers. So we've got one computer um, is your browser and one computer of course is going to be a Raspberry Pi Pico. And this is how the various messages get sent between them. So our request parser code is going to need to be able to pull all of this information out of the request data being sent by our client and then present it to us in some sort of usable format so that our code can then handle it correctly. Now, as a note, the format of an HTTP request is part of the official specification for HTTP protocols. So, so please do have a look at, at this web address. And again, I'll, I'll put links to that in the description down below and where you can get full details of the full scope of an HTTP, HTTP request. OK, so. Let's have a look at my request parser class so we can start to gather some information we can use then to handle this request. So to make this code um, easily reusable, I've encapsulated it into a class definition. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with classes, um, these are the basics of object oriented programming and it allows us to basically to box up various bits of data and code in, into these ideas of objects so that we can very easily manage them. And that means that we can present an easy to use object or class that in effect hides all the complexities of our code in, into this um, one object. So all of our um, parsing code for our HTTP request will be built into this class, which will then give us a, a simple um, sort of interface that our other code can use to easily access the information without having to worry about how it's actually um, working. So if we take a quick look and a run through of this request parser class, you can see that we first come to our constructor method. And this is going to take in the raw request data and then prepare the class attributes to hold the actual decoded information that we're after. So we first of all make sure that our request data has been decoded into the standard Python string. And then we create our class variables, which are going to hold each part of the request that's going to be passed back to our main code. So I'm just simply going to create a number of dictionary objects here to hold the request headers, the decoded query parameters, and then any other post data, whether or not it comes across as our form data or as URL encoded data. I'm also making a note of the boundary marker if there is one. And then finally, a Python list to hold each of the lines of the actual request content or body. So our constructor finishes by actually calling the parsing code, and that will actually then decode our request and fill up all of our data variables. So what this means is that our main code then just simply has to instantiate a request parser object, give it the raw request data, and then that will just respond back then with our fully parsed request with all the data that we then need to use in these class attribute variables. Now we've already been through the general structure of our HTTP request. So all of the code in here is just simply decoding that structure and gathering all of the data and putting it into these class attribute variables. So I'm not gonna go through that in, in detail here. Um, I'll put some comments in the actual code itself. So, so please do have a look through there and, and hopefully you'll be able to follow how that's actually working. And don't forget that each tutorial that I produce has its accompanying page on my main Bytes and Bits website. So do check in the description down below for a link to that, where I actually do go through um, the code in a bit more detail.
So let's jump on to our Raspberry Pi Pico and check that we're getting the right data coming out of our request parser class. So this code we're looking at here is the request parser test.py file. And again, all of the code we're using here will be in the tutorial repository. And I'll put links to that, of course, in the description. So all that this little bit of code then does is to receive the request, then hand it to our parser class, get back the results, and then print out the received data and request info. So we can throw a few requests at it from our Postman app. And we can see then that our class is decoding the request headers and data and allowing us then to concentrate on handling our request without now having to worry about how and in what format that request was sent to our PyPico. So now that our code is able to deal with requests, we need to consider what we need to say back to our client. And we're now going to have a look at the HTTP response. Now, as we saw in the first program where we were using our Postman app, we needed to send a coded message back to stop Postman complaining about it. And this um, coded message that comes back then is our HTTP response. And it's an important part of the whole HTTP protocol communication. So the response message allows our web server to tell the client if the request was successful and to return any data required to complete the action. So this data could be in, um, the actual HTML code for a page that the browser wants to render, or it could be the data readings from the circuitry the Pico is monitoring. It could also be an error message if, for instance, the page being asked for doesn't exist. And of course, that gives that notorious 404 missing message. But the important point here is that the response message needs to be in the correct format for our browser to be able to understand it. So let's have a look at what this format looks like. So we're going to send a request to a time service at timeapi.io. And that really is a little API system that simply returns back some data to tell you what the current date and time information is for the um, time zone that you specify. So, so we're going to use this um, request URL. And if we do that, we'll get back a response um, block of data. And then and this is what it looks like here. So, so again, this is very similar to our request message. Um, it's a plain text string which is sent back as a series of bytes of data. The first line of this contains the protocol used and the response code and description. So you can see here we've got HTTP 1.1 protocol, a 200 response code, um, and that then is saying that that was an OK handled um, request. Now, there are, of course, a whole range of response codes that you can look up, look up in the HTTP specification, uh, and they are all three-digit numbers, and they're grouped together by the first digit. So codes beginning with a one are information codes, two are successful codes, three are redirection codes, four error codes, and then five are actual errors on the server itself. So, so for us, we're, we're, we're just going to simply um, restrict ourselves down to either returning back a successful code 200 or, or perhaps we might send back a 404 if the request we received, we don't know what that means. So after this response code line, you can then see we have a number of headers and these work in exactly the same way as the um, request headers and again give information about the response and the return data formats. So, so the important one um, for us in this response is the content type header, and that tells us that the body of this response contains data in JSON format. So there are, of course, a number of other headers in there, and again, they give us information about the server and, and so on. Now, after this header section, again, we have that blank line, and then it is followed by the response body, which will contain the data that's being returned by this particular response message. So we need to build this response for each request that we receive so that our Raspberry Pi Pico can complete the HTTP communication and send back whatever it is that the person has requested from our Pi Pico.
So if we look at the response builder.py file, you'll see that I've built all the logic into a class that takes the data that needs to be sent back and formats it correctly with required headers and so on. So, so if we go through the code then, um, we first set up a few constants that will be used to reply back to the client. And the server just identifies itself as our Raspberry Pi Pico. We then have our class constructor, which basically creates the class attributes and initializes them to sensible values. And we then have a number of setter methods. So our main code will be using the request parser to work out what the client is asking for. It will then need to decide how, to re how the request went and what data needs to be returned. And the main code will then use these setters to store that relevant data into this class. So some of the setters let you add specific values into the header of the response. But we then have the serve static file and set body from dictionary methods. And these then are designed to help with attaching the relevant return data. So if the user is requesting a web page, then, then usually we're going to send back a mostly static HTML, JavaScript or, or CSS file. And this is where the serve static file method actually handles that for us. So our request parser will return the requested URL. If we then decide that this points to one of our web page files, we can simply pass that file to this method and it will attach the file data and then set up the correct headers for the response. If we look through the code, we can see that it first of all checks to make sure that we've got a correctly formatted URL. It then checks to see if that file actually exists on our Raspberry Pi Pico. And if it does, we then work out what type of file is being requested so that we can set that content type header to the correct value. We finally then attach the file contents and then put that into the response body section. The other one then was the set body from dictionary method. And, and in that we simply send in a dictionary that's going to contain all of the data that we want to return back to our client. So our method then turns this um, uh, dictionary object into JSON formatted code that fully describes the data and objects in our Python dictionary. So this code is then attached then as the response body and we'd set the content type to this application slash JSON type. So finally then, in our class, we have the actual build method. And this assumes that everything else has been set up correctly beforehand. And it simply takes all of that information and builds it into the correct data string that needs to be sent back to the client. So with this all set up, of course, we can test this then. Uh, and again, we're going to use this Postman app to, to retest our response builder. So here I'm running the response builder test.py code. And again, all of this is in the GitHub repository that I'll, I'll link to down in the description. And I've just simply set up a couple of endpoints um, in the request handling section, which, which I'll discuss in a second. And, and that will then will allow us to send back certain responses. So in this first request, we're going to request a web file. So just one of the static HTML files. And you can see there that our response then comes back from our PyPico with that data attached as the response um, content. We can also then set up um, some programmed API um, calls. So here we're calling a, a, a method um, in our API and that will return back some data. And again, we can see it coming in here as our JSON data. So we've now effectively got either end of our web server and we just need to work out how we can actually handle these requests. So we know that when our client sends an HTTP request, we can use this request parser class to decode it. And that will then give us a requested URL and some data also being sent across. So to handle this request, we need, first of all need to filter out any special endpoints that we're going to be setting up. And these would be sort of like our API call endpoints and so on. Once we've worked through all of our special endpoints, we can really assume that anything left over then is the client requesting one of our web files. So if we look at the full request handling section from, from really the, the one of the final tutorials, um, which will be coming a, a couple of goes after this one, um, we can see here that um, 
this is a, ver a fairly straightforward process. So, so once we've parsed the request, we can test the URL value to see if it matches our, in, in my instance here, a, a slash API endpoint address. So that's the web address that I've set up to access the API system. So if it does, we can then start to break down the data that's being sent across with the request. So in my API, um, again, and, and you can you can you can format this whatever way you want, but I've decided here that um, we'll have a simple um, slash API endpoint address. The actual action that I want the API to take will then be sent across as a variable. So our client must send across an action variable either as one of the get parameters or one of the posted parameters. Uh, and that, of course, then will decide um, what actually happens to handle this request. So, so really, we, we simply decode that action variable and then simply here looking at that and then running the appropriate section of code that will actually handle that action and generate our response status and um, data. So once we've handled any special cases that we might have set up, and again, I've only set up one here, then we can really say that the rest of the request URLs that fall through from here will, will be requests to our HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files that, that build up our actual web interface. Now to generate these files, um, we'll probably use some web editor outside of our Python development system. And those will generate these static files, which we can simply load into our Pico's internal storage um, in exactly the same way as you do with these Python code files, just um, right clicking and uploading them there. Um, so these files then do become accessible from our Python code. Um, you can use folders and subfolders to separate out these web files um, if, if you want to, and that can just help you better organize them. But of course, we've already built in the ability to handle serving of files um, into our response builder class. Um, and doing that, you can see here, it just makes it very, very easy now, where we can simply take this requested URL, pass it across to our response builder, and it will then work out whether that's an actual existing file or, or whether we need to send back some sort of respo um, error response. As I said, um, this really does now give you the full web server, or at least enough web server to be able to serve a web interface and then handle API requests and so on. Um, the next step, of course, then, there's a few other steps. Um, this development of the um, web interface. So you can see here, there's a number, I've developed a number of um, Code, um, web code files here, which will build up a nice user interface so that um, our client can sort of call up our PyPico and then interact with the devices and so on connected to our, our, our PyPico through a nice web interface. So there's obviously that side of things to do. Um, but the, the next thing we're gonna have a look at in the next tutorial then is um, our, our current web server has one big fatal flaw, and that is that it uses what's known as blocking code. So we have a line where we try to accept a connection from the client, but the unfortunate thing here is that this line, once we execute it, it will actually sit there um, on that line of code waiting for the next request. And if a request doesn't come along, it doesn't go off and do anything else, it just sits there waiting. So, so in effect, our PyPico is actually completely um, inert at this point. Uh, and it isn't able to get past that line of code until somebody requests something. So if, if you were running some sort of timed update loop, um, perhaps controlling motors or, or monitoring devices and so on, then putting a web interface into your project will basically kill it um, by getting stuck at this line of code each time you come through. So there are a number of ways around this. Um, of course, we have a second core um, in our Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, some of your other devices may not have that. So there is a second alternative where we can actually use something called asynchronous coding. Now, as I said, that's what we'll be covering in the next tutorial. Um, and then that will allow us to build a non-blocking web server. And then after that, we'll probably have a look then at building the web interface and a bit of um, web, web coding um, for that bit. So 
To make sure that you don't miss out on those next tutorials, please do make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click that notification bell and to make sure that we get it, you know as soon as those tutorials are released. Um, all of the code, as I said, will be on a GitHub repository and I'll put a link to that down in the description. And that will actually contain all the code for this tutorial and all of the following ones. So please do download that and have a look through uh, at what we'll be doing in the next um, sessions. I hope you're enjoying um, building up your web server. Do have a play with it. It becomes a very powerful tool um, for being able to communicate more easily with your projects. Um, so have fun messing around with that, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. So, bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects, and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and visit my website.